But what is my favorite, most supple bike under $2,000? What is this concept of planing? And how can you set up your bike better if you are a heavier rider or riding with heavy loads? These questions and more in our very first Q&A session. Welcome back Pathless Peddlers. And if you're new to the channel, we are all about the non-competitive side of cycling. So gravel exploring, bike touring, the supple life. So I thought I'd mix things up on the channel and have you guys ask questions and I will try my best to answer them. There's so many things in the bike world, in the bike space to cover. And I just don't have time to make videos about everything I wanna do videos about about. So I thought this would be a good kind of catch all format. So with all that aside, let's jump into the questions. Uh, first question, a lot of people have asked similar questions. This is by Tom Vo Vo Voigt. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. If you were getting into bike packing and the supple life today with no bike, what would be your pick for under 2K? So as you guys know, my most supple bike of the year last year was a very expensive breadwinner, which was just awesome. But there are lots of options under $2,000 that won't break the bank. Depending on how you like to enjoy the supple life, whether that is loaded or kind of just quick and sprightly, there you've got options. Let me grab my list here. So if you're looking for a lightweight tour, more of a, a day riding bike, a bike that'll go on paved and gravel roads and still be pretty interesting, I would definitely take a look at a bike like the Midnight Special. Uh, that was one of my sleeper favorites from last year. And along the same lines, like the Surly Crosscheck, very popular bike, and there's a reason. It's super versatile, it's fun to ride, uh, pretty snappy, but you can take a load with it. Another bike I really liked from last year was the Kona Rove. It comes in different flavors, uh, so there's some right at 2000, but there are many options kind of in the middle at about 1500. If you want to load things up, uh, you know, the Journeyman is a great option. Again, they've got sub 1000 to just over uh, $1,000. And of course, a bike that I really enjoy enjoyed uh, from last year that that's under a thousand or that's under two thousand is the uh, Jones SWB complete bike I believe it's seventeen or eighteen hundred dollars slightly on the heavy side you might not necessarily need or want a uh, 275 uh, plus size tires but if you do it's it's a blast to ride um, I know lots of you want suggestions for uh, more affordable bikes that are that I think are supple and there's, there's actually lots of options out there and I'm planning to explore more of them uh, this year. So next question comes from Nonchalant Garage and he asks favorite racks. He also has a YouTube channel so you should check that out. So I have a real soft spot for racks. Um, they're definitely one of the pieces of bike gear that I totally nerd out about. In terms of a, a beefy rear rack for rear panniers, I really gravitate towards the tubus stuff. There's one particular model that I'm looking at right now. I believe it's the the Eco or the Cargo. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm gonna put a link in the link below, but it's a, basically a two tier rack. So you can have panniers on the lower tier and a tent on the upper tier and be good to go. For a more minimalist uh, support, let's say you're just supporting a Caradice, then something like this really minimal Velo, Velo Orange rack or these new racks uh, formerly made by a Rat King, by Rat King, I believe that's a brand, but our friend uh, Daniel, Daniel from Tumbleweed is taking over production. So it's basically uh, just a real minimal uh, bag support, but it also has brazons for water. In terms of front racks for uh, running front panniers, I like the, again, the tuba stuff, either the, the Terra or the Duo. Uh, between the two, I feel the Terra is more adjustable. Uh, the Duo uh, requires a fork with, uh, with eyelets that go all the way through the fork. The Terra you can get away with, uh, with forks without that. For smaller Pertour rando racks, um, you know, the rack by Velo Orange is really good. I also really dig uh, the the uh, Rollin Demi Pertour. I don't know if they're still making that, but that's a good balance between a cargo rack, a rando rack, and it's not as big as something like the Specialized Pizza Rack. There's also a, a cool alternative to that, which is the uh, Simworks uh, mini Pertour rack. The only bummer part about that rack is it doesn't use the traditionally shaped tombstone. So if you're going to use a rando uh, bag with it, it won't quite fit. You might have to jury rig it with like a toe strap or something. And lastly, uh, probably the most versatile uh, rack you can uh, find. Uh, you can use either, either on the front or the bag and that is the Marks rack by uh, Rivendell. Not cheap but definitely versatile. Use it for as a rear bag support or as a rando rack. Okay, next question is by the Ashrock. Uh, heavy duty bikes or how to raise a bike's maximum capacity to or rider, or rider weight capacity? Uh, so a couple people have asked uh, this question about you know, a bike for a heavier rider. Uh, we have a little bit of experience with this. When we went bike touring, um, you know, there was, uh, we, we had long haul truckers 
and we carry about 150 pounds of gear and that does not include our body weight or the weight of the bike. So uh, all told, we probably had 300, 300 plus pounds of, uh, of uh, stuff on the bike. So what I would suggest is to uh, first off, start off with a bike that's meant to carry a heavy load. I think that's a better choice than to uh, retrofit a pre-existing bike. So I would look at something made for loaded touring. You know, the tubing is gonna be thicker and stiffer so it doesn't wobble and flex. So a bike like the Long Haul Trucker or the Salsa Marrakesh, um, those are the bikes that I just kind of tend to know about off the top of my head. Other things you can do is definitely get a higher spoke count wheel. Uh, so you could look into uh, wheels designed for tandem with uh, spoke counts in the 40s. Uh, you know, more spokes is gonna make a stronger wheel and also use a wider tire. I would definitely start looking at tires at least 45 millimeters, if not wider. That way there is just more tire to support you and still provide some cushion. Uh, if you're starting out with a narrow tire, that's just, it's just gonna be a rough ride. So definitely go wider on those tires. At those weights, uh, a real supple sidewall probably is gonna do more harm than good. So I would look at kind of more durable casing uh, tires from brands like uh, Schwabe. So uh, a beefier uh, touring frame, higher spoke count uh, wheels, and a tire, wide tires with a little bit more uh, supported sidewall. Okay, this question is um, from Clayton. Gern, uh, what does it mean slash feel like for a bike to plane? So if you've never heard the term uh, planing, it's by uh, Jan Heine, who we actually interviewed on the YouTube channel. I do try to get him to explain what that means in the PLP talks we did with, we did with him. So if you've not seen that, definitely check that out. But basically from the way I've come to understand this, this idea of planing, it's when your body and the bike flexes in a complementary way so that when you push down, it stores the energy and it releases it like a spring. So it has a lot to do with uh, frame flex, but there are also other contributing factors like rider weight. In terms of how it feels, I mean, I believe I've ridden a couple bikes that do plane for me. And basically it's this kind of just nice little springboard springiness to the bike. It's uh, less fatiguing and somehow it feels, uh, the bike feels somehow uh, just a little bit more efficient. Like it gives back as much energy as it absorbs. And this is kind of different from a jumpy bike where um, you just put in the power and the, and the bike squirts from under you. So, so there are definitely bikes like that, you know, the stiffer short wheelbase carbon bikes, but then also uh, kind of the more compliant frame materials, there is this little bit of interesting give and take. It's kind of hard to describe. Uh, I hope I'm feeling what planing is. Also hard to quantify, but it's my answer. A related question to that by Kaelin Tremblay. In a world with, ev with ever more supple tire options, does uh, frame slash fork material or construction even matter anymore from a ride quality perspective? This is a pretty uh, interesting question because I did have an instance where um, swapping the, the tires and wheels totally hid the imperfections of a bike. I'm thinking, uh, check out my bike review on the Aventon Quixote. That is a bike that uh, ships as 700C, but is advertised to be multi-wheel size. And I wrote it in both versions. And in the 700C version, I was kind of meh. But once I put on uh, you know, 650Bs with a wider tire, the bike did feel uh, a lot more fun to ride, a lot more supple, a lot more springy. And that brought up an interesting point of whether, you know, <laughs> how much of uh, is this suppleness uh, tire dependent versus uh, frame material. My, I think my initial reaction is that, you know, uh, construction and frame material does matter. I think you want to start out with as, as good a bike as a, uh, uh, you can get before, you know, adding the, the suppleness with the tires. Because the, the frame material will still kind of determine things uh, like weight and kind of lateral stiffness. So although the bike can be uh, supple, vertically compliant, have suspension with the tires, there are still other factors at play with ride feel. That said, I do think once you start putting supple tires, uh, it's, it's a little harder to discern the attributes of the frame material and construction than just from the tire. But I would argue, you know, it's, it's still best to, to, to start with a well-constructed uh, bike that uses good materials, interesting geometry, stuff like that. All right, final question. And this is from a Patreon supporter, uh, Mark Strayer. What kind of thought process would you use to decide between a bike like the Salsa Warbird and a bike like the Salsa Cutthroat? What trade-off uh, would there be for taking a bike with bigger clearance like the Cuddy and, smaller, and putting smaller, smaller tires to go faster? or bikepacking with the Warbird. So we've had a lot of experience with both. 
we dig both bikes, but there are definitely two different bikes. My thought process would be uh, to kind of figure out what kind of riding I would do the most and what my riding style is. I definitely feel like the Cutthroat lends itself more to uh, bike packing, really rough road riding, and in general is a lot slacker and more laid back in its geometry. The stack on that bike is fairly high compared to something like the, the Warbird. So if you want to get into an aero tuck, if that's important to you, then you know the Cutthroat is probably not the best choice. You know it excels at uh, loaded riding. You can use it for uh, gravel rides. Clearly, we chose it for Dirty Kanza. So if you're doing um, you know, a long endurance gravel event where comfort and stability are your you know, kind of primary factors and definitely go with the cutthroat. Uh, I would lean towards uh, more uh, towards the Warbird if I was doing you know, kind of faster uh, day rides, group rides, really light, lightly loaded touring that's gonna be uh, mostly on roads either paved or unpaved. You know, we've done a lot of touring with the Warbird and, and love it for that. Just because it, it's a little bit fun, gets a little bit rowdy, feels like you're under biking on rough terrain. But that's definitely like a, an acquired taste. I think the Warbird, you know, swapping out the tires doubles pretty well as a endurance road bike. Probably not as, uh, you know, kind of jumpy as a uh, bike with pure road geometry, but still pretty fun. Good for those long all day rides. I think in terms of uh, trade-offs with the, the Cutthroat, um, you know, again, you're gonna give up some aerodynamics just because the bike's not built for that. It's probably gonna lose a little bit of that quick accelerating feel just because of the longer wheelbase, longer chainstay, and all that stuff. So it's not gonna be like the road raciest bike. So that's kind of what you give up. But you do gain a lot of versatility. You know, you can take it uh, on some pretty good single track on gravel roads and use it as a, as a pretty chill and comfortable road bike. So I think that's it for this session of Q&A. Uh, if you guys like this kind of video format, let me know in the comments below. And if you have questions that you want answered in future videos, leave those in the comments below. And until next time, keep the supple side down.